My name's Steve Higgins. I work at Durham University, which is in the northeast of England. But my background's as a primary school teacher, uh, and that really where my passion for uh, evidence and research started. Uh, when I moved into higher education as a researcher, I was really frustrated at the amount of evidence and information there, there was in, in journals that would have helped me as a classroom practitioner. So part of my interest has been thinking about how do we summarize and make findings available and accessible to teachers in a way that informs professional decision making. The toolkit's now actually five years old, so I've been thinking about some of these problems for a while, and what I'm going to do today is try and explore what I see as some of the tensions in this approach to communicating research results to teachers uh, in the light of the toolkit and what I see as the tensions that underpin it. So I'm going to talk a bit about that, the Southern Trust Education Endowment Foundation toolkit. You'll hear tomorrow from James Richardson and Alex Quigley a bit more about the work of the Education Endowment Foundation. I see really the toolkit as a, as a model, one way of doing research communication to support use. And as I mentioned, I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the tensions and limitations and how we intend to develop it. Um, I'm going to talk about these specific tensions uh, in terms of what I see as being important ideas to bear in mind when we're thinking about research communication and its use in professional contexts. Because it obviously needs to be accurate and accessible. It needs to be in a form that teachers can see and understand but reflect the evidence uh, clearly enough. It needs to apply to the context that they work in. And as I was talking to the group before coffee, it, it needs to be applicable but also acceptable. It's no good coming up with research findings that apply to a context, particularly in teaching, but that don't fit with the teacher's values or their beliefs about what will be successful. So that's a particular tension, I think, in teaching and learning. And then they also need to be appropriate. It's often, we often assume that research findings will be a solution for everyone that because something's been shown to work in a randomized trial and has, on average, a positive effect, that then that is something that everyone should do. But I think it's far less clear that that's the case if you think that what you get from the results of a randomized trial is an average treatment effect, then that will apply differently to a high-performing school or a high-performing teacher than a low-performing school or a low-performing teacher they'll be distributed differently about the mean of an average treatment effect. So that notion of appropriateness, I think, is really key. And then I'll talk a little bit about the importance of results being actionable. It's probably the area where the toolkit is at its weakest and why the work of the Education Endowment Foundation is starting to focus on how we develop campaigns that change practice. Could I just have a quick show of hands, uh, just to know how much detail I need to go to? Have you seen this, the toolkit? A quick show of hands. OK, that's actually quite encouraging, thank you. Um, what I suppose we, we were trying to do was provide a summary framework that helps teachers understand the relative benefit of different teaching and learning approaches. It's important to say that it was set within a very particular context in England when the government announced it was going to give additional funding for disadvantaged students, students from poorer backgrounds. Uh, they were giving a significant increase in funding that schools then had to justify how they spent that money. So there was a very particular policy context for which the teaching and learn learning toolkit was a solution. It's not a general solution to the best way to communicate research evidence. It was a specific solution in the English context at that particular time. The National Audit Office in England suggests that about um, two-thirds, over 60% of head teachers in England say they consult the toolkit. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they use it effectively, but it has had a, quite a dramatic impact on the system. And what we tried to do, if you're familiar with the work of John Hattie in Visible Learning, it's not a million miles from that. What we're trying to do is to take evidence from meta-analysis about the impact of different approaches using tested attainment, and I recognize all the limitations of focusing on narrow outcome measures, 
And I guess I see the toolkit as a series of related umbrella reviews under an overarching framework. They're averages, so it gives you ideas of something like what might be best bets. It shouldn't determine practice. We've tried to look at quality criteria in terms of designs applicable for causal warrant, although we also think it's important to say something about areas where the evidence is weaker, not just where it's strongest. And we converted uh, standardized mean differences, effect size into months gain. Again, there are problems with that, which I'll talk about later. And we also looked at estimating the costs of adopting, because it was set in this policy context of additional funding that schools had to justify, we thought it was important to get schools to think about the relative benefit of different approaches in terms of their impact, but also the costs of adopting. The economists in the room won't like our model because it's simply additional spend. It's not looking at things like teacher time or use of building resources. It's looking at, I suppose, purchasing power for the additional spending. So that's what we were, were trying to do, come up with some sort of basic cost-benefit analysis of different interventions and approaches, try and summarize the evidence as best we could to give an indication of what that might look like, and give some idea of how robust the evidence is in terms of an, an icon representing that, which were padlocks. The other thing it's really important to say is that our view is this informs professional decision-making about spending, resource allocation, choosing a, a effect, uh, approaches that are effective. It's not about determining best practice or determining practice that schools should always adopt. From the Education Endowment Foundation's point of view, it's also provided a framework because they then commission further research uh, particularly randomized trials, I think they're up to about 125, 850,000 pupils involved in the research, and the findings from that are then fed back into the toolkit. So it's an iterative process. I'm not going to talk about that side of it today. So this is what the toolkit looks like. You can see the broad themes. These are actually uh, rank ordered in terms of impact. We, we don't do that on the original version because we found that people were just looking for those that had highest impact and didn't really look further. Our argument is that you might choose interventions that have a lower than average impact, but that are particularly appropriate for your setting, or you've got an understanding of why they might likely to work with your class or school. But that simple structure is what makes it accessible. Teachers get what we're trying to do without a long explanation of how to search for or find things in a database. So that's both its strength and, to some extent, some of its weaknesses. At the moment, I think we've got 34 approaches in here, and you can see they range fairly widely. Another potential criticism of the toolkit is that some of these things aren't quite of the same order. Can you really? classify all digital technology approaches in a single bucket or basket? How does that compare with summer schools or something like reducing class size, which is more of a policy intervention? So there are loose association of ways to bring about improvement, but these are driven by the kinds of things that practitioners say they're likely to invest in to bring about improvement for disadvantaged learners. That sets up another set of tensions. You'll see as we go down, I'm describing these as good bets or high risk. The argument here is that a teacher might choose to do something that's high risk in the same way that you might have a long odds bet on a favorite football team or on a horse because you've got some insider knowledge or commitment to making it work. I think it's important in making decisions about evidence that we encourage practitioners to take responsibility for making things work not just accepting the idea that the evidence suggests that they've worked somewhere else. Because that in itself may change the way they engage with the evidence. If they choose and commit to making an approach on reading comprehension successful, that's probably rather different from me telling you that you must do that because it is successful. That engagement for me is a crucial part of the professional transaction. But you can see that the comparative nature of this structure encourages teachers to think about the relative benefit 
of the different approaches in terms of impact, cost, and security of evidence. We've developed an early years version, partly because the government extended its funding, and partly because early years practice tends to be rather different in settings in England, uh, the UK generally. And the next thing that we try and do in the toolkit is layer the information. So that's the top layer that's supposed to whet your appetite and get you to think about what the value might be of different approaches. Then each of the pages has a layer below that goes into some of the detail, defining a bit more clearly what's involved, talking about how effective it is and what the range of effects are talking about the security of that evidence, the way we've estimated the costs, and the sorts of things we think schools should bear in mind as they implement different strategies and approaches. Sometimes those are driven by practical approaches. Sometimes they're driven by the regression analyses and the meta-analyses that suggest that certain kinds of interventions may be more successful than others, or certain types of implementation length who they're delivered by, those kinds of features. Because the EEF is now commissioning projects in this area, there's also a link to projects that are either ongoing or that have reported that would bring up more relevant evidence in the English context, although again, there's an interesting question about do you take the kind of global summary, which probably draws on evidence from North America more strongly, or do you look at contextual information from the local area in terms of interpret interpreting the likely benefit? The next layer down is probably the least accessed, except perhaps by education students, where we try and set out the detail of what we've used to come to those judgments. So the technical appendices, contain the abstracts from all the meta-analyses, the effect sizes, how they differ for disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged, and any further issues about the evidence base. Trying to make it as transparent as possible, but without overloading uh, the, the reader, we do include the DOI links, the digital object identifier links, to go to the studies, but that, of course, depends on whether or not teachers have access to online journals. In England, that's largely not the case. Okay, a couple of other tensions that we've come across it's probably worth talking about. We wanted to put the outcomes on a single scale that teachers would understand, which is why we went for month's progress rather than effect size estimates. When we started off this project, we were convinced pretty quickly that when I talked about standard deviation units and effect sizes, most teachers' eyes glazed over. But then that meant it was rather difficult to think about what's a common metric from age five to age 18, and month's progress was the best that we could do. But of course, that does vary. Those of you who are more technically minded, uh, standard deviations change with age, so effect size estimates change. So it's our best fudge, I guess, our best guess about how to create a consistent scale. Similarly, with cost effectiveness, this is very much relative to pupil premium spending in England. It's basically just taking costs and putting them on a five-point scale relative to the additional money schools get per disadvantaged pupil. So again, that might not work in another context because that like, unit of spend may not make sense. But that gives you an idea of the simplification that we've gone to to try and communicate the relative cost benefit of dis different approaches. We've included an evidence assessment. When we started on this, we used a star rating for evidence, where the more stars, the more robust the evidence. But we found there that people thought the more stars, the better in terms of impact. So we went to padlocks, although these days I get questions such as, why do you have handbags on your front page? <laughs> and again, that's one of the issues. How do you communicate simply and effectively in a way that people get what you're trying to do without overloading? And I'll come back to that in terms of accuracy. So you can see I've got concerns, if you like, about the level of accuracy that we've decided is our compromise for the toolkit. And part of my compromise with the Education Endowment Foundation is having those layers that you can go into more deeply to see the effect sizes in the technical appendix. Uh, 
but we also realized that that was not appropriate for the surface level of the toolkit. The other issue is that because we aggregate meta-analyses, you're looking at broad patterns where actually the error estimates, both within and between meta-analyses, are probably of the order of one or two months on our scale anyway. So they're giving very broad brush findings about things that tend to be better bets than others. The level of specificity is definitely limited. But the advantage of what we do is it communicates the comparative benefit, on average, of these different areas. So a teacher coming to the toolkit almost always automatically asks some questions. Whereas if you go into the What Works Clearinghouse in the US, you've really already got to know what kind of program you're looking for and have a three quarters formulated question before you can get an answer. It's not easy to explore and rummage around in the What Works Clearinghouse in a way that gives you productive solutions. So that overarching framework, I think, is definitely an advantage. There are other problems with the accuracy. We're kind of assuming in a Hattie-like way that there's even bias across all of the different fields. That's almost certainly not true. It depends on the scope and quality of the underlying meta-analyses. Well, they vary enormously. Our conversions tend to oversimplify. Uh, and I think we're probably at the limits of what you can do at the meta-analytic level. The ideal, ideal would be to, I suppose, unzip all of these meta-analyses, put them in a new meta-analysis, and code it accordingly with uh, equivalent inclusion criteria. But that's probably more, it would take more time to do that than I've got working years left. Um, the other thing I think it's important to say in this audience is that the toolkit, I would argue very strongly, does not attempt to provide definitive claims about what works. It's trying to give a best estimate of what's worked I suppose partly thinking about internal validity, but also thinking about understanding the limitations of research studies in specific contexts. So we know that transferring research findings to other settings is always problematic. I mentioned at the beginning some of the issues around average treatment effects in randomized control trials and what kind of population you're thinking about. Randomized trials don't give you a causal mechanism, and as David mentioned this morning, that's really important. You probably need to understand not only whether something worked, but how it worked, if you're going to use that information to bring about improvement in your school. We also know that researcher-led interventions tend to differ from larger scale, either school-led or system-led, so there's probably, you'd expect a reduction in impact as you scale. And I'm passionate about the argument that Teachers and schools need to see these as solutions to problems rather than just adopting something that someone says worked somewhere else. You need an understanding of how it's going to be valuable. I think we've got accessibility right in terms of that top layer. I think the problem there is it may encourage oversimplistic interpretation and it's harder to get deeper engagement. And there's a clear tension between accessibility and accuracy. What it has let us do is produce charts like this that get schools to think about the relative benefit. And you'll notice we say promising and needs careful thought, not do these and not these. It's all about getting engagement from practitioners about why they may see particular benefit. Okay, I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes about are people actually using the toolkit, and a little bit of information about which strands they look at and what we think drives engagement. That comes from Google Analytics, but also some online reports from schools. Now, I'm not going to go this into a huge amount of detail, but we get quite a large number of hits on the toolkit website uh, that the Education Endowment Foundation set up about four years ago now. They actually Unique page views over this time period, 800,000. You can see that's increased over time from 2011. The spike was probably the shift in uh, website from one server to another. Probably lost some data at that point. But you can see that what we're getting, these are three-month periods. In a three-month period, we're getting about 40,000 hits. 
So it's definitely being used. We know rather less about how it's being used. We can see which strands schools look at, and that all I can say is I think that reflects those that are at the upper end of the toolkit, but also those that in England a particular topical interest like mastery learning or our National Centre for the Excellence of Teaching Mathematics has been pushing a mastery-based approach. So you're getting schools looking up things that they're perhaps less familiar with. But you see there's quite a distinct distribution in the kinds of themes that teachers are looking at, with the ones at the bottom 100 or so views a month, as opposed to up in the thousands for the most regularly um, reviewed. Schools in England, of course, have to report their pupil premium spending on their website. And though they're not insignificant sums, and they'll often be quite detailed statements about what they're doing. So I've chosen one example where it's very clear that they've actually looked at and engaged with the toolkit, because they've looked at the high cost, high impact kind of quadrant layout and set out their solutions according to that particular grid and then mapped their spending onto it. So we at least have examples where I think schools are using it well. How representative those examples are, I'm not yet sure, and we're trying to undertake some work to find that out. Are they simply justifying what they were going to spend anyway using the toolkit, or are they actually using it to inform their decisions? That, for me, is a crucial question. This is a good example of where I think they're at least engaging with the structure and information that's there. In terms of applicability, um, again, this is hard to work out, but we've chosen the themes according to what schools are interested in. You can see the pattern of hits. The overall patterns of effect seem to be fairly similar. The problem, of course, is that because of the nature of the data, these only come up with a good general bet. They're averages of averages. They're not age-specific and subject-specific. It would be nice if we ever did create a toolkit that was single study driven as opposed to meta-analysis driven, you could bring out different summaries. The other issue for me is it tends to focus on general teaching and learning solutions and then not curriculum and subject specific. That's averaged in with the average effects. I've become quite interested in this feature of the toolkit more recently. How acceptable are the findings? The idea that they have to be applicable and acceptable enough, but they've also got to challenge current practice. It's no good teachers just looking at the toolkit and thinking, oh yes, that's right, we do it anyway. You need to think about how do you get, I've called it the zone of proximal professional development. Those of you in teacher education will know what I mean. There's that space that you've got to push teachers and challenge them, but you can't make it so challenging that they're going to reject the idea straight away. So trying to create a range of options is, I think, uh, important. But if you notice my caveat at the bottom, acceptable solutions may not be optimal. We still need, may need to push at times and challenge teachers in terms of working with them so they trust the evidence and try things that perhaps initially they might have rejected. Appropriate is, again, one of the other areas that I'm focusing on. How do we know that the Toolkit solutions are solutions to a specific context. One way of thinking about the toolkit is it's got the answers from hundreds, thousands of studies, and you can't actually see what the questions were that drove those studies in the first place. You can see the research question, but not the underlying inquiry question as to why they were interested in met metacognition or self-regulation in the first place. What kinds of teaching and learning problems is metacognition and self-regulation a good answer to? We're less good at knowing that. We know it's a good general solution to get learners to take responsibility for their learning, but not the specifics of how to diagnose when a particular toolkit solution might be valuable. So the fit is often problematic and often needs professional diagnosis and judgment. I was going to often always needs professional diagnosis and judgment to think about the appropriateness of a solution in a particular context with a particular curriculum and a particular class. Where the toolkit is weakest, and you'll hear a bit more about this tomorrow, is making it actionable. How do you actually give teachers specific enough information that it's likely to be valuable next Monday morning with the class that they're working with? 
that's really hard to do when the lessons from the toolkit are much more general. RCTs, as I mentioned before, only provide warrant for the what. This kind of approach was successful there. And meta-analyses confirms the general approaches, that these kinds of things tend to work on average, but not precisely what you should do on Monday morning with your class. That needs, as we talked about in our last session, a different kind of evidence. I want to risk a complicated slide with builds, just to give you an idea, and I suppose to whet your appetite for my colleagues tomorrow. And the toolkit for me sets, sits in the middle of an evidence, I suppose, ecology. I'm responsible for the toolkit, systematic searching, synthesis, and regular updates. The EEF then commission projects on the basis of that. They work with partners to do that, and you'll hear tomorrow a little bit about the research use trials that they then commission, that they've commissioned to see which approaches are successful with schools. There's also a whole dimension of practitioner engagement, developing campaigns, the website itself, conferences and evaluation guide that feeds into wet practitioners' appetite to work with them to come up with joint solutions to practice problems. There's also a policy influence. The EF works closely in the UK with the uh, Department for Education. We're also trying to develop international partnerships, one in Australia and one in Chile at the moment. Because my, my vision, if you like, is to create an international evidence data lab with all of the studies that are available in every language that's available that you can then configure by pressing a button for your age and subject that will then summarize the findings for you. Whether I'll ever achieve that or not, I don't know. We're working, of course, with uh, a range of organizations uh, in terms of thinking about the best practice in summarizing, using things like Prisma Guidelines, Consort. Those are, these should be familiar to you if you work in systematic reviewing. We're starting to do these new updatable meta-analyses for each strand, but that, as I mentioned before, will take us a long time. I'd just like to finish by going back to that model, because I think one of the challenges is, in thinking about effective research use and communication, is that it's the relationship between these categories that makes it most difficult. I mentioned before accurate and accessible. This notion of applicable but acceptable, appropriate, how do you make it actionable? How do you do all of that in a single mechanism for communicating research? Well, you probably can't. This needs to reflect the system or the ecology or a set of interacting organizations and responsibilities that holds this in place. But for me, unless you get each of these dominoes in a row, they won't all fall down neatly in terms of getting impact. And I think the, the tensions are very clear in that we've worked hard, I suppose, on accurate, applicable, starting to work on actionable with the EEF. Accessible, we get good feedback on, but appropriate and acceptable, that's very much a practice responsibility. We'll never be able to determine that in advance. That will always require partnership in terms of the way we work with those in schools to bring about improvement. We can share some of that responsibility, but it'll never be something that we can determine in advance. Thank you very much. <laughs>